Sure to do. <clears throat> I have a mouse trap here, a rat trap. And um, we have a mouse trap. Oh, Chris says we can start. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> we have a mouse trap here for a reason. So just in case you get bored with what I'm saying, you can just look at my mouse trap and think about that. We will, that prop will be used later. Um, so we're going to be talking about sort of uh, thinking about combining the concepts of, of does the Bible teach critical thinking, which we talked about last time, and then the origins of life issue, which are more important to some people than others. But um, obviously we should know what, what, what we should know. Um, and also what the Bible does and doesn't say. So... We might have a word of prayer now, except that people keep coming in. Well, we'll pray anyway. Um, eh, maybe we'll start. There's just the people just keep coming in. <laughs> All right. We're just going to have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together and, and uh, talk about um, things from thy word and pray that uh, we'll be... Um, building us all, ourselves up in our most holy faith, drawing closer to you and learning more how to, uh, how to be uh, better believers, better testimonies, more obedient. Um, and uh, we, we think of so many people around the world that don't have this opportunity. We think of people who are, being, who are suffering for their faith right now and, uh, and thank thee for that, for that we can, we can uphold them. Um, and thank thee for the fact that we aren't going through those things right now, but pray that we might be, and in the sense, as I said earlier, about building ourselves up in our most holy faith, that we um, will be strengthening ourselves so that we'll be able to handle whatever society throws at us. So thank you for everybody who's here tonight. In the name of the Son, thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So... Um, just thinking uh, some material we've covered before um, regarding critical thinking. <clears throat> the Bible gives us dozens and dozens and dozens of instructions regarding that. Um, and a couple that we've talked about before, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Um, you know, don't take positions you take lightly. It's better not to take a position at all, a position at all, than to take a dumb position. Um, uh, <clears throat> It involves humility. You know, Romans 12 is full of this. You know, he's got two re references from Romans 12, but don't, don't think too highly of yourself. Uh, you're not that great. Um, and, uh, and so if we can keep ourselves under control that way, we're going to be more able to uh, pursue the truth. A study to show thyself approved unto God, shun, uh, shun fro profane and vain babblings. Um, <laughs> that really tells you something about how we should handle the entertainment that is currently commonly available. Um, we're going to try to outline some of the common origins of life issues, um, some that will, will be clearly anti-biblical, and some that will be appropriately controversial, um, because uh, uh, Christians hold different, different views, not unreasonably, I would say. <clears throat> um, and tonight wasn't, I don't, I don't have it really set up to be a debate about different views, but more an overview of the, of the territory. And if there's interest in, in diving into a couple of the views and, and having a, a more in-depth um, which one is correct uh, um, uh, presentation, we could do that. Um, one of the things about critical thinking is knowing the opposing views. Uh, and this is a quote from John Stuart Mill that we've also covered before. And it reminds us that when we're going to... Oh, incidentally, we've got handouts for everybody if... Um, if, uh, if anybody doesn't have a handout. Emmanuel has some back there. Um, but you have to be nice. Um, the, uh, um, and, and this is certainly something that's explained in the scriptures numerous times, but you've got to hear opposing views from people who believe them, who are competent with them. You don't pick the weakest example of an opposing view and say, uh -huh, see, it's wrong. You pick the best example of it, the most intelligent, the best versed in, in the opposing view, because the opposing view might be right. And, um, and if it's wrong, you've learned something. If it's right, you've really learned something. Um, does the topic of origins of life matter? And to the extent that it matters, partly depends on 
on where you are in life. Some people, they've got two jobs to work and a family to look after, and, and the, the most straightforward reading of Genesis 1 and 2, there's, there's no, they've got higher priorities than to dive into every possible permutation of, of belief. And so I don't mean to be suggesting tonight's talk is higher priority in, in anyone's life than it necessarily needs to be. Um, but there's, uh, the, the, the reason we first started talking about doing this was largely with respect to um, high schoolers and university students who are, if they're going to a secular university or a secular high school, they're gonna be faced with some potentially, as believers, with some potentially really tough uh, decisions that as a church body, as a, as a body of the body of Christ, it's kind of our job to help equip people for whatever they're going to face um, and it, when, when we can anticipate it. It's really dumb to be sandbagged by an anticipatable problem. I'm not entirely sure anticipatable is a word, but I think it works, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, but what, do, what does matter is we care about what God's word is and we realize that some issues are more important at any given time in our life than others. Um, that we appreciate what it says and what it doesn't say. Um, because an awful lot of people assume, in my opinion, a lot of people assume that the Bible says something that it doesn't and maybe ignores stuff that it does. Um, the famous Mark Twain uh, quote about, it's not the parts of the Bible he doesn't understand that bother him, it's the parts he does, that it does. Um, the book of Genesis in particular is central. Um, you can't say that the book of Genesis doesn't matter because, or is a myth. The reason is it's quoted throughout the Bible as fact, uh, including in the New Testament, including by the Lord. Um, and, uh, and yet, Bible-believing Christians, um, serious evangelical Christians, come to different views of what Genesis says. And so we'll touch on that a little bit, but we're gonna concentrate more on, on uh, the, the, the greater um, uh, amount of the talk will be on the evolution um, part. Um, I guess I've already talked about this. I'll, I guess the, the, the third bullet there is, is might be of interest. Um, or maybe the second bullet too. Homeschool parents. I think uh, th this may be an area of uncertainty for a lot of homeschool parents that it might be helpful to, to get more clarity on. Um, and, and that's actually something we could consider doing if there was an interest in the homeschool parents just having a discussion about this just from the perspective of homeschool science teaching. Um, and of course, there's the issue of uh, if you're a high school science teacher who believes that we have a creator God, um, it could mean you're going to be seeking employment elsewhere. Right. Um, and so there's uh, those sort of factors, the reality of, of uh, knowing what the, what the scripture says and the implication it has for our life. Um, when we're talking about any of this stuff, be careful that you don't take assumptions as facts. Let's put assumptions in the category of assumptions and not pretend otherwise because this area that we're talking about is going to require lots and lots and lots of assumptions. It's, it's necessary because the God's given us a fairly limited um, data set. And so and a, an example of assumptions that, that you really need to, to have narrowed, uh, narrowed down if you're going to pursue this subject in depth is what me dating methods do you accept? because we can't prove our dating methods. So you gotta assume somebody is right and somebody is wrong, or not. Say, hey, we, certain things we can't know. Um, but, it, but be aware of when an assumption is an assumption. Um, if you have an, an assumption, there should be a plausible mechanism for that. And so the rat trap will make its first appearance. So it, let's say it's 10,000 years from now we assume the Lord will have come by then, but just, just for the sake of the thought experiment. And you're digging for your petunias out in the backyard and you come across this, right? Pretty simple little tool, rat trap. And you say, huh, they used to use these to catch rats. And you say, huh, that probably just evolved. Some oil sort of congealed and some iron ore turned into a stainless steel and uh, turned itself into a spring. And you know, it's pretty obvious. These kinds of things happen. Now, if you could present this 
uh, present a plausible mechanism by which that could occur, that would be a reasonable thing to talk about. But you'd be straining anybody's um, belief in your, in your ability to, to have any cognitive um, um, appropriateness uh, if you didn't have a plausible mechanism. The rat trap will take a short rest. Um, so you, you want to have plausible mechanisms. It's really nice if you can test. Ooh. So I'm still getting the hang of this pointer. Because I'm trying to do this as a straight line. And look, it's going all over the place. Um, so what was that? OK. <laughs> Um, which assumptions can and can't be tested. So if you've got an assumption that can be tested, test it. But unfortunately in this area, most of them won't be able to be tested. Um, define what you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about dating, say exactly what you mean by dating. If you're talking about carbon dating, or uranium thorium dating, or ocean core dating, or Antarctic sediment dating, sediment dating Ha know what you mean by dating. And if you don't, um, ask people questions instead. But I, I hear people talking about these areas that are, that are pretty complex scientifically. Um, and, and they just sort of, they've read something, they've read a headline on, or it's watched a, you know, YouTube and they, they, they sort of think they understand it when you ask them the simplest question about it and they don't. But they have, hold strong feelings about it. Try not to hold strong feelings about stuff that you don't understand. Um, and if you can't define it to uh, educated child's level, you probably don't know it. And uh, that's, that's, you know, whenever um, my colleague uh, who finished first in his class, well, while he's in medical school, he was mopping the floor in the, at St. Vincent's um, operating theater. And uh, he was, they were cleaning up the room after surgery when he was mopping the floor, and he asked the surgeon who was starting to walk out something about the case. So this guy's mopping the floor, and he asks an intelligent question about the case. The surgeon looks at him and said, you wouldn't understand. Now, this guy was probably quite a bit smarter than the surgeon. Probably knew as much about surgery as the surgeon, actually, and, and, and um, uh, he's an unusual guy. So, um, but it was really interesting that this guy didn't, uh, and, and you wonder, could he have explained it? If you can't explain something to people, you probably don't know the subject. And that's actually a good thing to practice, you know, to say to somebody, hey, if it's, this is an area that matters to you, get in the habit of, of uh, explaining it to people and see how you do and say, hey, did that make any sense? And if they say no, try again. He said no. He made an assumption. Yes, he also made an assumption, um, and uh, you never make an assumption. About the mopper. Yeah, about the mopper. The surgeon made a, made a, a bad assumption about the mopper, um, and he'll certainly never get a referral from us, I'll have you know. <laughs> Not that we hold grudges. Uh -uh. Um, uh, but in actual fact, uh, so, so, uh, just <laughs> digressing for a second, a surgeon who's like that to a janitor is unlikely to be the kind of person you want taking care of your patients anyway. Yeah. Uh, there, there's, the, it says a whole lot about, about their background. Um, uh, the second bullet is kind of interesting. In any position you hold strongly, ask yourself, what kind of information would make me change my mind? What new facts? And when you're reading people who are writing about stuff, um, and this is, I'll, I'll give an example from Charles Darwin, because he was actually a pretty honest guy. He said, if this and this and this isn't proven, my theory is nuts. Right. In actual fact, those things were proven to be wrong, but that didn't stop them, and they, they kept his theory. Um, but he actually built in tests of his own theory that we'll talk about. Um, it's never a bad idea to say, you know, okay, I want to buy a, a Dodge truck. What would make me decide to buy something else instead? Um, and if you apply that to every complex area, because um, very few things are as complex as a Dodge truck, um, then, uh, um, then, then, you're, then you're going to be uh, able to f much more fully understand the, pro uh, the, the topic. I drive a Tacoma, incidentally. <laughs> Uh, a more refined vehicle. Um, and you don't need to take a rigid position about everything. Um, if you don't know enough to be sure of something, hold your positions lightly. Uh, so we're going to try to
talk about the major models for uh, the appearance of life on Earth. I'm going to be trying to cite sources that are fairly dominant, um, that, are, that seem to be appropriate. But there's a ton of material out there, and I'm not going to, I don't even know about all the different um, opinions out there and, and ideas. So, um, so I don't think you could even pretend that this is a comprehensive review. So if you look at the common positions, there's Darwinian evolution, and that also includes neo-Darwinian evolution, which is basically Darwinian with addition of the known, uh, some of the known genetic issues from Mendel. Um, theistic evolution, um, intelligent design, young earth creation, old earth creation. And there's quite a bit of overlap, I would argue. Um, people often talk about macro and micro evolution. Um, and so it's useful to sort of know what we're talking about tonight when we use the word evolution is macro evolution. So speciation, um, large scale evolution over time. The micro evolution is the stuff we actually can observe. That, that's for real. Um, and uh, I put, uh, what example did I, okay. Uh, resistance of malaria to chloroquine, um, bacteria to antibiotics. Um, some of those things are natural selection, but some of them are actually genuine uh, genetic change. The uh, brown bear becoming a polar bear. Um, these things you can actually demonstrate were true evolutions. But they're microevolution. They're actually tiny. They're not speciation. Uh, they don't, uh, um, but it's a mistake to say that all evolution, it doesn't, that no evolution occurs because we can demonstrate evolution on, on that micro scale. Um, and I, I mentioned, every now and then I'll, I'll just comment on a book, but this book, Edge of Evolution, um, is, is, a, is a really nice um, review of what we know about what can occur with evolution and how long it takes. Because even these microevolutionary changes take an incredible long time. And if you try to translate that into macroevolution, it becomes into area of impossibility. Um, um, but with any time scale that you care to mention. And then natural selection is another term. Uh, that's, once again, something that we all see. Um, you know, um, if you run faster than the other guy, then the bear is going to eat the other guy. Um, it's, it does, it's not much more complicated than that. So you don't have to be faster than the bear, in other words. You just have to be faster than the other guy. Um, which reminds me, do you know how you can tell the difference between a grizzly bear droppings and a brown bear droppings? Anybody know? Well, brown bear droppings, you're going to find twigs and berries and things in the, in the dropping. And in the grizzly bears, you're going to have like belt buckles and revolvers. And, um, okay. Um, Darwinian evolution. So that was developed in the middle 1800s by, by Darwin. And, uh, and it says that all living things are descended from a common ancestor, basically an amoeba, a single-celled critter of some kind. Um, through natural selection, acting on undirected variations and unguided processes, a true random process. And that's the problem with it, of all, of all things, um, even from a, from a scientific position, in, independent of any theo uh, theological positions. And um, the, the quote, design is, a, uh, is an illusion, uh, is, comes from Richard Dawkins, who's one of the major atheists presenting this view right now. Um, and he says, you know, the funny thing about life is it looks like it's designed. And it's not, but it looks like it's designed. Isn't that something? And it's kind of a funny comment. He, uh, I love that one. Uh, so it's um, widely accepted. It's, it's uh, in most circles. It's not controversial, and it's not going to get you, you know, get you into trouble. So, if if you want an easy life, be an evolutionist. Hang the theology and hang the science. Um, the problems. It denies the possibility of a creator God. And when does science? When does science say that a major hypothesis shouldn't be even entertained? So just from the scientific perspective, that's unacceptable. And yet it's people have rolled over and played dead and, and just let it happen. Including, I would argue, a big chunk, probably the major chunk of the Christian world. Because it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't let it happen. Um, uh, it believes humans are not a unique creation. Really hard to see that in the scriptures. Um, that's a, a major problem from a theological perspective. It requires that life arise from non-life. No useful mechanism. Think about the rat trap. These things don't just happen. And when you don't have a plausible mechanism for life just appearing uh, through some lightning bolts and a few amino acids, you've got a problem. Um, in the 1600s, that was called spontaneous generation, that maggots came from mud. And now we look back at that and laugh. What's the difference between 
between the spontaneous generation of life and Darwinian, uh, the Darwinian worldview and m maggots coming from mud. I don't see the difference. Um, it has no explanation for the presence of complex information DNA. So DNA is unbelievably complex, um, despite being such a simple structure. The information contained in it, um, the coded within it, is, is really complex, and the way it's coded and decoded is really complex. And there's not even a hint of how this could happen. Um, there's no chemical, well, well I'll, give, I'll give, give a quote in a moment on the chemical mechanism, which is kind of the same as the DNA issue, just writ large. Um, and the complexity of life in terms of mathematical, you know, the statistical possibility of any of these things arising by accident, and uh, we could, uh, there's, there's numerous books on this if you ever want to, where the mathematicians have worked, tried to work this out. Um, and when we, there's a short video clip I have on, uh, on the bacterial flagellum that'll touch on that a little bit. Um, but whenever you start taking these different chemicals, primarily thinking amino acids, and start making them combine with each other in certain complex ways, strings, coils, folding the coils, bring in like in hemoglobin that you have four different proteins all in a precise arrangement with each other. Statistically, when the, to, to explain that in terms of happening by, by, uh, by an undirected process, you can't present any mechanism by which it could be done. The time frame is just too huge. Um, no matter how many billions of years you build into it. And that leads to, funny, the rat trap gets, a, gets to show up again. Um, this, complex, uh, this concept of irreducible complexity. So we talked about how if you found this or a Dodge Ram in your backyard, you wouldn't consider it. You know, if I found a, a Roman vase, from thousands of years ago in my backyard. I wouldn't say, wow, huh, a bunch of clay just sort of came together and glazed itself and, and, uh, and there's a little wine in the bottom. Um, uh, you wouldn't say that happened by accident. You'd say, wow, I just found a Roman vase from thousands of years ago. Um, but there's another is issue. So a, a, a mouse trap or a rat trap has only a few pieces. It's got the spring, it's got the trigger, it's got the base. Um, if you take away any one part of that, it doesn't work at all. And so the concept of irreducible complexity that we'll be talking about a little bit in the clip is that nobody can figure out how that could come together. And I'll give you some, some, uh, some references later on where people debate this and you can sort of see, because um, remember what you always want to know what the opposing view is and by experts with that opposing view. And so you'll, you'll have some references I'll, I'll give you. Um, <clears throat> that allow you to read how people try to explain this, um, this process, but it's, 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 it's pretty difficult to explain. That might be it for the rat trap. Um, so this is one of, the, one of the Darwin's tests that he, he wrote into his, uh, the one of his books, The Origin of the Species. Um, the manner in which species belong into several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest norm, known fossil, f f that's quite a word, fuss, I should have practiced this one. Fossiliferous, fossiliferous rocks. Um, so rocks with fossils. Um, may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. So Darwin, he was putting together a theory, seemed to be an honest guy, smart guy. And, uh, and what, what he was basically saying is, if we can't explain these fossils that even in the middle 1800s they were aware of, and, and the Cambrian explosion refers to one particular time of, of, uh, in geological history using conventional data. This is based on conventional dating mechanisms, not uh, young earth dating mechanisms, um, where all these things all appear at once. You know, out of the, there's about 27 major, I think 27, 28, 29, something like that, major phyla, major types of, of animals, like birds, for example. Um, and about 20 of them all showed up at once with no intermediate life forms. And we don't, we can't explain that if things came up by tiny little um, steps, which was another one Darwin's test. I don't have his quote here, but he said, if, if we have find that life did not develop through multiple tiny incremental steps, then my theory is wrong. Um, and I think, I think we can say that that's been shown to be the case too. Um, theistic evolution is 
Um, so Francis Collin is, Collins, Collins, uh, uh, who is up until recently was the head of the NIH, um, uh, is probably the major figure in uh, theistic evolution right now. Um, but it says that God created life over billions of years by a gradual process of evolution that was guided by God. So it's basically evolution guided by God. So at least it gets away, you know, at least you can say, we don't know how all this happened, but God made it happen. So I guess it, you can ex it, it, it's not much of an explanation, but it is an explanation. Um, many of us have real problem with that sub bullet there. Man is a result of evolution from a common ancestor. So single cell critter becomes multi cell critter, becomes hominid, becomes us. And Adam and Eve are two examples of us that get picked out. Um, really hard for us to see that in the scriptures. Um, it does reduce the conflict between Christians and anti God evolutionary scientists. Because a lot of evolutionary scientists are comfortable with the God's concept, don't worry about it too much. Some of them are, are Frank Atheists and Richard Dawkins would fall into that category. Um, so the, the problems with theistic evolution are the same as the problems with regular evolution by and large, unless you just sort of say, oh, God did it, that's okay. Um, uh, but it does, kind of, the theistic evolution really does come into conflict with Genesis one and two. And so, the way Harzma is, is a, a really nice lady, who, accomplished scientist who writes a lot about this. She's a theistic evolutionist, and the way she handles it. So theistic evolutionists take the scriptures, you know, they have a pretty light grip on the scriptures, I think it's fair to say. And uh, so, for example, she would, this is a direct quote from her, Genesis 1 was not to address the how and when questions, it focuses on the who and why. So in other words, you don't, the, the exact words that are used and so on, you don't have to worry about them too much, um, is how I would interpret that. Um, and uh, and I, I gotta admit, I can't, I can't not take seriously Francis Collins' associations with Chinese research and you know, all kinds of stuff that he's involved in, that you, th you just sort of wince and think, you know, this is a guy who doesn't see the world the way I see it at all. And that does influence my, um, my uh, views a little bit. It also, theistic evolution also does not answer the basic problems of biochemistry that I just referred to. How did a protein get formed that actually functions? How did the DNA get formed that codes for that protein? How did the RNA get formed that knows what to read off the DNA and when, and when to start and stop? You know, all these, all these different steps that we don't have a, a plausible explanation for at this point. Um, I guess I've already talked enough about irreducible complexity that biological systems have multiple parts that are indispensable to the function of the system. Think rat trap. Um, so if, you're, if your rat trap is evolving, okay, we'll have rat right, right. And you have a spring evolve. Well, it's got to get in the right association with the base and the, and the, uh, and the um, um, uh, the thing that crushes the rat and the trigger, right? All this sort of stuff has to come up, come together. If you're busy putting energy into evolving the individual pieces, but they're not all coming together, then there's just a bunch of spare parts flopping around the, the organism. And that doesn't help anybody. And it's a evolutionary, in terms of evolutionary times, it's actually a waste of energy and would normally be a negative. So nobody can figure out how all these things come together uh, in, the, in the evolutionary model. Um, and, I remember the first time I, I looked in a biochemistry textbook and I saw a drawing of something called a bacterial flagellum with all of its parts and all of its glory. It's had a propeller and the hook region and the, the drive shaft and the motor and, and so on. I looked at that and I said, that's an outboard motor. That, that's designed, you know, that's no chance assemblage of, of parts. Behe's reaction was not surprising. For the molecular motors that drive bacteria through liquid, each depend upon a system of intricately arranged mechanical parts. These parts come into focus when portions of a cell are magnified 50,000 times. Biochemists have used electron micrographs like this one to identify the parts and three-dimensional structure of the flagellar motor. In the process, 
they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motorboats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. The bacterial flagellum, two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. To see why, we must understand a feature of molecular machines known as irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity was coined by Mike Behe in describing these molecular machines. Basically what it says is that you have multi-component parts to any given organelle or system in a cell, all of which are necessary for function. That is, if you remove one part, you lose function of that system. The idea of irreducible complexity can be illustrated by a familiar non-biological machine, a mousetrap. The trap is composed of five basic pieces. A catch to hold the bait. A strong spring. A thin bent rod called the hammer. A holding bar to secure the hammer in place. And a platform upon which the entire system is mounted. If any one of these parts is missing or defective, the mechanism will not work. All components of this irreducibly complex system must be present simultaneously for the machine to perform its function, catching mice. Irreducible complexity also applies to biological machines, including the bacterial flagellar motor. All told, there are about 40 different protein parts which are necessary for this machine to work. And if any of those parts are missing, uh, then either you get a flagellum that doesn't work because it's missing the hook or it's missing the drive shaft or whatever, or it doesn't even get built within the cell. In evolutionary terms, you have to be able to explain how you can build the system gradually when there's no function until you have all those parts in place. Any questions at that point before we go on? Mr. Smythe, any questions from anybody except Mr. Smythe? <laughs> No wonder you were napping. <laughs> but now I wanted to share one thing real quick. Um, what was actually the day of my salvation where I actually accepted Christ, and it was uh, an old gentleman got up and asked the question, who threaded the eye of the needle? And, it's, and, and the question was, there's a, a, a tiny hair-like muscle that runs through your skull that connects to the eye to cause right and left rotation. And his question was, how did that muscle structure get through the skull of your brain and function? It, it had to happen all at once. Same kind of thing as this, an irreducible. Yeah, because remember, that, that little outboard motor, it's only part of the cell. It's not the whole cell. It's only actually one tiny part of the cell. You could, you could use the same argument that they made for the outboard motor or he used for the abducens muscle. Um, to look at just part of the cell wall, and you're still faced with each of these little chunks, tiny chunks. You're faced with the same problem. That just a part of the cell wall is unbelievably complex. Um, yeah. 
Um, so this is a comment by James Tour. James Tour is a really interesting nanochemist. Um, so he he uh, he makes chemicals happen, um, designs them on a computer, puts them together, so he develops drugs and things like that. Um, uh, he even makes little race cars that only work under electron microscopy, um, uh, little molecular machines. Uh, and he's uh, he's a um, very outspoken evangelical Christian. Um, and uh, if you ever feel like it, go to his website and uh, see how a, a Nobel Prize level um, scientist uh, presents the gospel. It's, 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 uh, it's, he's quite a guy. But he, um, he's also a pretty open-minded guy. He said, look, if you can give me a mechanism for evolution, I should reconsider this. Um, I don't see it chemically. I don't have a model from which to have chemicals come together and to make that first cell. Nor do I have a chemical model that makes any sense to me go, to go from that first cell to koala bears. He doesn't mention koala bears, but he means to. Um, the, the, it's, it's this lack of a mechanism that should really bother us. Um, and the mechanism also involves information because uh, the DNA, the key aspect of DNA and RNA and all the, the whole, the whole uh, genetic uh, machinery is information. It's, uh, you've got this incredibly simple and conceptually simple um, pattern which allows incredibly complex structures to be built. And so, you know, most of your cells, with the exception of maybe your red cells, have all of the genetic machinery, all the genetic code to make all of you, and lots of other people too. Um, all in that tiny, 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 tiny little fragment within a tiny cell. And um, where does that information come from? Because natural selection doesn't produce information. Natural selection makes use of information but it doesn't create information. Um, so let's talk about intelligent design for a second. Um, it's, not, it's not a biblical area. And I sometimes read articles by um, creationists who say about intelligent design. Intelligent design makes no, it doesn't pretend to be a, a, a philosophical position. It's science. Hey, um, we, we're here to say that this stuff didn't happen by accident. There's an intelligent designer. Um, so it, uh, it, it uh, comments on patterns of evidence that intelli in indicate intelligent causes behind the origin of life, um, inferences from scientific evidence. Uh, Seattle has something called the Discovery Institute, which is probably the, the major world center for intelligent design. There's lots of people around the world that work on this. Um, and Steve Meyer is one of the, one of the outspoken, uh, uh, one of the most visible spokespeople for the uh, movement. Um, it's dominated by Bible-believing Christians, um, old earth, young earth, but there's atheists and, and uh, Buddhists and everything, because uh, it's, it's a scientific discipline. It's not a, it's not a religious area. And so um, the, some of the stuff I read, it's almost like creationists feel threatened by intelligent design. All it is is a, is a science resource, nothing more complex than that. Um, and so it looks at science that explains observed life in nature. It doesn't try to explain the age of the earth. Um, it doesn't identify the designer, um, but it's a very, very useful resource. If, uh, if you're interested in, in origins of life, um, uh, then it's, then it's a, a very useful resource. Young earth creationism, it's probably the area that most of us grew up with or most familiar with. Um, briefly, it's, it says that the age of the universe is six to 12,000 years, um, that the Genesis uh, one uh, days of creation are six literal days. Uh, that there's no animal death before the fall, no carnivorous animals before the fall, um, that the, 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 the universal flood created a lot of the, uh, much of the earth as we know it now. Um, and it's sort of, sometimes people put it under the, the, uh, the heading of catastrophism, meaning a series of short-lived catastrophes led to the world that we see. And it's the, certainly the most literal meaning, uh, uh, reading of, of Genesis 1 to 3. And a couple of good sources. Um, Ken Ham is probably one of the most uh, well-known because of the ARC project and so on. Uh, may not be the best source, but he's certainly um, very, very well-known. Well known. Uh, Jay Siegert is an engineer um, who's become, uh, his, his whole ministry is, um, is evangelism through um, uh, discussion of the creation model. Um, and he would be, he's a good, good one to use as a resource as well. Um, we're going to go on to old Earth models in just a second, but it's useful to, to think about where the, 
biblical young earth and the biblical old earth models overlap. Um, they both uh, affirm a creator God, the redemptive work of, of, uh, of Jesus Christ, the role of the scriptures as um, our, our sole authoritative uh, revelation. Um, they both would say that humans are a fairly recent unique creation. 6,000 years is not unreasonable for, the, for humans. Um, they both uh, would hold that there's no universal common denominator, that, that there was no single cell um, thing that God turned into something else that turned into us eventually. And they both would, uh, <clears throat> would argue that you were not seeing evolution causing speciation. In other words, uh, basically animals reproduce according to their kind, that, that God created these lines of, of animal forms. Um, where they don't agree um, is the, uh, the period of time. So old earth creationism says that, yeah, God created everything um, over a very, very, very long time, fitting closer to what the, the dominant science views. Um, and uh, there's this two book concept, which in reality is the, the old earth guys talk about it more, but it's part of young earth thoughts too, that the stuff that we see around us is a second form of revelation, like in Romans 1. Um, and sometimes that's attributed more to the old earth group, but I don't think that's really necessarily um, accurate. Um, probably Hugh Ross might be the most well-known proponent of this view, his organization called Reason to Believe. Um, so the old earth creationists um, would claim that there's no conflict between Genesis 1 and mainstream scientific chronology, and we'll talk about how that, how that um, can be in a, just a second. Um, many of them, if not all of them, write positions to be testable. In other words, as we learn more about science, we should be able to look back at whatever model we use and say, we got it right or we got it wrong, because the Bible only gives us a few sketchy details. Um, and they've been, uh, the, the, the old earthers tend to be um, I'm pretty outspoken about this. Hey, we're going to try this. If we find out the Big Bang didn't work, you know, isn't correct, we're going to have to change our minds. Um, and that's, that's okay. And then that, I'm, I'm okay with that too. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of interpretations of the Genesis 1 um, that fall into the umbrella of old earth creation. And um, the day age view is the one we're going to be talking about because it's probably the dominant one right now. And it says, the creation days aren't 24 hour days, there are six non-overlapping periods of time. Who knows how long? Um, and, uh, and this is really an interesting part of it that's, that's worth wrapping your mind around if you're interested in this subject, and that is that they, they see these three different um, sort of series of miracles. One is God establishing all these physical laws and all that kind of stuff. Um, the, the spiritual nature of humans, um, gravity, space-time, all this stuff that, when I say space-time, I can't even tell you exactly what I'm saying. You know, they, these, these, um, uh, these things. Then there's um, uh, the transformation miracles that, that, that where they basically sort of nudge the system along over those six long periods of time um, within the laws of physics. And then sustaining miracles. Um, so the reason that we can be living on Earth is because of a whole lot of really, really finely tuned aspects that if any one of those bits of tuning went out a tiny bit, we'd freeze or fry. Um, there wouldn't be much option otherwise. And freeze and fry pretty quickly. Um, and uh, and the, the um, interesting aspect of this is that they sort of see for example, we've got gigantic deposits, bio, uh, um, uh, biologically, act, uh, bi biologically uh, pr um, formed deposits of, say, oil, right? Billions and billions and trillions of, of tons of oil and gas and, and, uh, um, and coal. You know, so much there that we've been hauling out of the ground in the case of coal for hundreds and hundreds of years, in the case of oil for 120, 140 years. Um, pumping out like crazy, and there's still tons there, right? It's not, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we don't even know how much is there. Um, and if, as we believe, that comes from uh, biomass, then that's a lot of biomass. 
and really hard to explain in a 6,000 year time frame. And so that's where they, they talk about these, um, uh, these transformational miracles, the idea that there's all this stuff formed on the earth preparing the earth for us. It's kind of a really a a fascinating concept that, uh, that's worth, worth knowing about. Um, the, uh, the arguments between um, young and old earth sort of fall into two categories as I see it. This is kind of my construct. One is the biblical areas. So they obviously can't agree on what the word day means in Genesis 1. Um, morning and evening. Is it morning and evening or is it chaos and order? Um, there's, these, are, these are pretty valid discussions to have. Um, did animal or plant death bef uh, occur before Adam's sin or did the curse only apply to humans um, in, in the sense of death? Um, does the biblical text allow for a very old earth? Because obviously you can't be an old earther and a Christian without saying you can explain it with the biblical text. Um, was Noah's flood local or universal? I haven't been able to wrap my mind around why this is such a big deal between the young and earthers and old earthers, to tell you the truth, but there, there's something there. Um, and the Old Testament gene genealogies factor in here too, because the old gene if the Old Testament genealogies um, are, are taken as written, then the old earth concept becomes very difficult. Then there's the science aspect. So that was the, sort of the biblical aspects. And this is the science aspect. So did the Big Bang occur? How do we handle radiometric dating? Geological evidence, that's things like the Grand Canyon, ocean floor cores, Antarctic cores, um, things like that. Uh, where do non-human hominids, the Neanderthals and that fit in? Um, what hasn't, hasn't been constant? And that applies to things even for like the speed of light. You know, this, this is a huge area. Um, and as you can imagine, it's not all that um, straightforward. When, if you believe in the Bible and believe in different aspects of the words, suddenly it's, it's a lot more complex than, than uh, you'd want it to be because it sort of makes your head hurt. Um, but uh, um, one useful thing to think about in terms of how you look at the scriptures and how, how, you, how open-minded you be about, about some of these concepts is to go to the, the verse I have up there. And if you read those verses, and let's say it's 1500. So Copernicus, 1550 maybe, somewhere around there. Maybe, some, no arguments, so I hope I'm sort of close. Um, Galileo a little bit after that. Um, but before that, so you're a, you're a Lancashire farmer with your Bible in 1500. Um, and, uh, and you're reading those verses, you'd say, the earth is fixed. Earth is fixed, sun moves. The earth might be round, but it's fixed. Um, and then you'd say, this is very clear from the scriptures. Very clear from the scriptures that the earth is fixed. And you can do a little experiment with yourself. Put yourself in that, in that farmhouse in Lancashire in, in 1500 and look at those verses without, the, without knowing about Copernicus and what we now think of as a heliocentric um, so, um, solar system um, and say, what conclusion would, I've, would a reasonable Bible scholar have come to? Well, we now know that the earth rotates around the sun. We don't have any problem with that. We, we, have, we therefore adopt a different way of looking at those scriptures. And it's really a, this is a useful, useful model that people should work through as an exercise um, before they take on the old earth, young earth uh, debate. Um, and, uh, and this is a sort of a related thought because I think there's a way more antagonism in these areas than, than there should be. Um, but when looking at the Bible text alone, is a young or, or old earth view mandated, or both could both or either one be reasonable, depending on which assumptions you're gonna plug in? Mr. Smythe. You know, you've already had one question. <laughs> and a statement. I'm old. Okay. <laughs> Yes. So then how can plants survive without the sun? Because the sun is created after the plants are created. And, each, and there's, there's a thousand issues like that. Yeah. Um, 10,000 for both positions. Um, and, you, and it comes down to what assumptions? Where did the light come from? Because um, uh, you know, was there light before the sun as we know it? Yeah. That, yeah. Um, and so it's those, those kind of things. And if we ever wanted to, if, 
we could, and just lay out the old earth, young earth position. I don't actually see it as a, as big a deal as some people see it. So, um, but if, if, we, if we ever want to, that'd be kind of fun to do maybe for some people. Um, and so if we we're gonna wrap this up, hey, John, do you see that? It's 7.30. It happens to me too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, evolutionary models really hard to reconcile with scripture. Some of us would argue it seems to be impossible. They lack a plausible biochemical model. So they're, some of us would argue they're pretty hard to reconcile with science. Um, it's like they occur, like I would, pres I would suggest that they exist in order to get away from the concept of God or a designer. Um, they fail to explain the appearance of life from non-life. That's a big deal. And I would, I would have less problems if my friends who are ardent evolutionists said, you know what, There's these, there, there are a bunch of problems that we've got. You know, the mathematical issues, the spontaneous generation of life, um, you know, these are things we struggle with. But I don't, when I talk to my friends, they, they don't, doesn't seem to bother them. Um, uh, I'm far more likely to see a young earth and old earth are saying, hey, we can't explain, you know, what came first, light or the sun? Um, uh, you know, Ken Ham would say, you know what? If the Earth is six thousand years old, how do we explain light that came to us from stars billions of years ago? You know, this is a problem. Um, that that kind of kind of honest thinking should be part of everybody's because none of us have all the answers. Um, and I don't see that theistic evolution really gets us any further personally. Um, intelligent design is just a, is a, is, is a whole different field. It's, it's simply a, um, uh, a, um, a grouping of people who say, there was a designer, we don't know who the designer was. Or some of them say that we do know who the designer was, but they don't, that's not what they get together for. They get together to discuss the science, not, not who the designer was. And then the old earth and young earth models are both held by, by, um, by evangelical um, biblical Christians, uh, but they rely on widely, uh, wildly varying uh, concepts, uh, definitions, and assumptions. Um, grammatical methods, appearance of death, um, dating methods, biochemical processes. And to understand it, you have to understand the assumptions of the opposing view. Um, and asking questions is more productive in this area than arguing. You know, this, there's an awful lot none of us know about this stuff. And so, um, uh, uh, I, 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 we really should not have these areas create antagonism, because we're all pretty ignorant. Um, in your handout, um, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly go through, do we have a couple minutes just to go through why I've included the books I have? John's not yelling at me, so. Um, so creation, evolution, intelligent design, that's actually a kind of a, if you only had one book on the subject, this is it. Small, um, it, uh, it covers the, it doesn't, doesn't cover Darwinism, but it covers theologic, uh, theistic evolution, um, intelligent design, old earth and young earth creation by proponents of those areas, qualified pro proponents. Um, and it, um, it then allows the, those who don't agree with them to respond, and then a final response from the primary author. So each of these areas goes through, and they're able to cover the high points of, of each of the beliefs. And so if you really want a, a good sense of where all these guys are coming from, this is actually a single volume that, um, that, isn't, that, that will certainly give you a great overview, probably better than any other source I know. Um, this is an older one, Darwinism, Intelligent Design. This would be a really good book, probably for high school people who are uh, just getting into science. Um, it really just addresses Darwinism and the scientific um, alternatives. It doesn't really deal um, with uh, creation, um, the creation side of it. Um, Jonathan Wells is one of the uh, Discovery Institute guys. Um, Darwin's Black Box, uh, so that's by Michael Behe. He's the guy that was talking, doing most of the talking about the bacterial flagellum. Um, and uh, it's a really, um, a classic work that deals with the probabilities um, and the um, seeming impossibilities of, of seeing the biological systems that we uh, study come about through uh, random uh, variation. Um, I mentioned Jay Siegert and the Starting Point Project. Um, 
And whether you're an old earther or a young earther, um, uh, he runs a Grand Canyon rafting thing every year. Um, it's like five or seven days. Um, you go rafting down the Grand Canyon with him where he, and he teaches about geology and stuff. He's an engineer. Um, plus, he's a very engaging guy. Um, <clears throat> so if there's, if there's somebody from the, with an opposing view that you'd want to spend time with, he's the guy. Um, Ken Ham, he's the uh, ARC, uh, the, that ARC in Kentucky guy. Um, what do you call that, the ARC project? Um, ARC in Kentucky, yeah, that's it. Um, seven days that divide the world. This is a handy primer for those who um, don't really get the seven days of creation thing and how anybody could be an old earther and believe in the Bible. If that's, your, you know, if that's, if that's something, something you're struggling with, this is a, um, a, it's written by an old earther for a young earther. He's an Oxford, Oxford uh, mathematician and uh, an ev evangelist. Um, and he's also a very engaging kind of guy, so like Jay Sigurd. Um, debating design. So this is a higher level book um, that pits, so take the bacterial flagellum, for example. It pits uh, a, a, um, an intelligent design guy saying, this couldn't happen by chance, against an evolutionist who say, this is how it could happen by chance. And then they both, they both are, present their views, and then they both respond to the other ones. And so it's, uh, and there's four topics in this book. So it's another one that if you're prepared to, for a little higher level science, um, it's a fantastic uh, education in how intelligent, thoughtful people who appear to be trying to go for the truth come up with um, uh, radically opposed ideas. Um, signature, uh, signature and cell, it's one of the, uh, and both return to the God hypothesis, um, these are both sort of manifestos of the intelligent design movement. Um, uh, pretty heavy duty tomes. Um, you, can, you can press leaves under them and stuff like that. Um, but if you really want to know the area, it's, it's good. And um, if you want a sort of contemporary work on Darwinism from the, Darwin's, from the uh, neo Darwinist perspective, um, then Richard Dawkins' book is probably one of the more readable ones um, The Blind Watchmaker. And um, in all this, I think it's easy for believers to get too engaged in a technical area because it doesn't really demand much of us, in a sense. It doesn't demand obedience to the scriptures. It doesn't demand encountering our, our own sin, that kind of stuff. Um, and it allows us, if we think we're right and the other guy's wrong, it allows us that little self-righteousness and arrogance that feels so good. Um, so... In any of these technical areas, if we can remember that there's a lot we don't know, that John 3.16 is a much more important area to understand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a whole lot more important than having worked out whether you're a young earth or an old earth creationist. And um, when you're discussing this with people, only by pride cometh contention, but with a well-advised is wisdom. So if you find yourself having contention over the issue, it's probably a problem you've got. And I'm looking at myself first, because I'm, by nature, a confrontationist. So, um, so that's, that's, that verse is for me. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway. Any questions, debates, arguments, thoughts? Mrs. Smythe. So apparently this is the Smythe and Hassel <laughs> program. <laughs>
when he kind of floundered then, and his concrete, when James Bryan, and the concrete thought of going with Genesis as the actual time for the earth to be formed, then that case was, he lost his argument. He was blind, and, and evolution was then thus brought into the Tennessee schools, and then the publicity from that, which we know the whole case was staged, <clears throat> that, that whole thing, but uh, ended up allowing that to be open for schools to teach the evolution and stuff. So, I don't know if you know, but my question is, did William Jennings Bryan really know his scriptures, or did he really believe in younger, older people? Somehow, <clears throat> I must have missed that day in medical school. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't know. I don't know uh, anything about that. Sorry. Yeah. John pointed out it's actually law, not medicine. Yeah, but I didn't go to law school. Yeah. <laughs> so I was in Houston at a planetarium where you were seeing pictures of the galaxies expanding in the universe. And they were amazing because they took these from the Hubble and outside the atmosphere. And again, theories, they just show it expanding. I guess that would come under Big Bang? That's um, the, the uh, shape of the universe and the direction of the universe and the expansion of the universe concepts are so complex. They are complex. That I, I, I would hesitate to say that you could look at some video from the Hubble's telescope and get any sense of what's going on at all. Yeah, they had but they're pretty pictures. They're great. They're pretty pictures, yeah. and mm -hmm. they show galaxies colliding. Yeah, yeah. But it looks like when they measure light, it's expanding. Yeah, that yeah, awesome. yeah. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty complex. Well, don't the scriptures, uh, it's easy to read the expansion into the scriptures, too. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's, it's easy to read into the, the Big Bang, but it's also easy to say, wow, but there's sort of this, all these other different directions things are going. It's, it's, it's um, my, my physics isn't strong enough to be able to... Uh, you know the thing, if you understand the subject, you should be able to explain it? Yeah. I can't explain it. That's okay. Yeah. They were pretty pictures. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Townsend. Um, on your slide where you presented young earth creationism, you say the age of universe being six to 12,000 years. But isn't it completely possible that the universe, which is God, is infinite, so we can't date it, yeah. But in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That yeah, that's true. I, yeah, there's I, a difference between the universe and, and the earth. Yeah, I should have. I, that, that, I think I, the, your term, your wording would be better. You're right. Yeah. Picky, picky, picky. <laughs> no, you're right. Just real quick. I understand, and I don't have the answer, and I haven't studied it. Everybody learn from... Harmonica the, players don't have to. Okay, thank you. Um, Light does not travel at 186,000 miles per second. It's infinitely faster. So there goes some of the things that we are locked into. Now, I shouldn't speak out of school because I don't know the converse side. But How fast does light travel? They, I don't remember. I did read it, but it was more than 186,000 miles. It's pretty, pretty jolly fast. But one of the debates is, did it always travel, you know, is, is how, uh, how, um, uh, um, how much does the speed of light change under what conditions? It's, right. yeah, that's actually a whole separate issue. I can't explain that either. Remember, if you can't simply explain something, you don't know it. But we do have rainbows. Yeah, but we do have rainbows, yeah. Yeah, yeah, roughly 42 degree difference, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or thoughts? You're pushing it, Mr. Smith. <laughs> I like to rest in the scripture when it says a thousand years is as a day, and a day is a thousand years. And if you go back and you map out, according to scripture, because you can actually go in the time frame that are in scripture that doesn't, with what's given in the scripture, and you can get yourself to we're at around 6,000 years now. And if the millennial reign is a thousand years, which by definition is the millennial reign, we've got six days. Could be an interesting little time ahead. Chris, did you have some? Um, no. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, everybody.
Yeah. Oh, okay. go on. And I think it, it bears repeating again that if we, if we take the, the literal view of Scripture, when you do that, you come to some Scriptures. There's some, there's some places in the Bible that you can't just, um, you can't just do away with. Um, and I, I really, really appreciate what... Um, he said about knowing the opposing view. I've always been a big fan of that. Most of you have heard me say when I, I was raised in a Christian home and I got to be about 16, 17, I started thinking about what else all the other opinions are. So I, I started doing a lot of reading and research from the other side. So other religions, other worldviews. I've read um, um, a lot. I haven't read all of his books, but I've read a lot of articles and a lot of uh, some of Richard Dawkins' books, Stephen Hawking's um, read scientific, you know, research things from people that would definitely they wouldn't be caught dead in a place like this, right? And and then of course different religions and the idea is that this is the conclusion I came to and it's just my conclusion but I do feel like this is a something that everyone has to settle on. Everybody has to believe something that someone else either discovered or wrote. You, you have to believe something that for the most part that someone else discovered or wrote. And so we're looking at now, we're, we're, looking, we're living in an age where according to the Bible, like the book of Daniel says, knowledge shall be increased. We're living in a day and age where we have access to knowledge and to information that it's, it may be safe to say has never been available before, at least not in the, this, this um, as, as readily available as it is now. But, but what I finally settled on is just a simple, the, the Jesus talked about you have to come, to come as a child, right? In simple faith. So when I, when I come to the Bible, I just have this attitude, this idea, I'm going to believe it because if it, if it truly is from God, then it's believable, right? If it's truly from God, it's believable. And I'm going to believe it in its literal sense unless I absolutely cannot. When you take that approach to the Bible, it, it does create another issue, and this is kind of what we talked about last time we had this workshop, and we've we mentioned it before, but it creates this other issue, which is, okay, well, now if you're going to take that literal approach to the Word and the words of God, now you have to you know, say, what do we do when we have multiple books that all say, they all claim the same title, Holy Bible, but the words themselves are different words in the text. So that creates a whole different issue, and I'm not trying to talk about all that tonight, but I am saying it, it does create an issue that you actually have to look into. Now, again, if you want to take the attitude, like you said, there's a lot of people out there, they just, they're, they're trying to pay bills. We all know what that's like, Amen. <laughs> And they're all taking this attitude of, hey, you know what, I don't know where I came from, I don't know where I'm going, I'm just trying to you know, survive today, right? We understand that, but it's our job as believers to put this idea in front of them, hey, there is an eternity, uh, there is a heaven and a hell, those things matter. Why do we believe that? Well, because the Bible says so. And you get into the literal interpretations of things. If we believe the Bible literally, then there's a lot of things, like Jesus talked about hellfire, and brimstone and torment and things it's like wow you know it'd be really nice to just say i don't know if that's really what he meant that's just figurative but if we take the literal approach then it it really actually simplifies so many different subjects and of course it doesn't mean that we understand everything about the bible nor do we understand everything about the universe but it does mean we pay attention to things like in the beginning god created the heaven singular and the earth. And then you have certain Bibles that don't say that. There's only one Bible that says that. All the rest of the Bibles say heavens, plural. We know there's three heavens now, but in the beginning, it apparently there's only one. So as a Bible believer, you kind of start asking, well, what does that actually mean? What is that? What Now my mind goes into other places. What was that? So obviously, there's things that, that we could get into and talk about tonight. But what I'm trying to say is when you take a literal approach to the Bible, it it really simplifies things, but it also kind of gives you that 
I don't have to worry about having an answer for every single little thing. All I have to do is believe it by faith, knowing this, the other side is believing something by faith too. Right? Whether it's young earth, old earth, whether it's theistic evolution, whether it's, you know, atheistic, you know, Darwinian, everybody's believing something. And the attitude is, well, I'm just going to believe whatever it is. I, this is what a lot of people are doing now. I don't really know what it all means. I don't understand it all. I just, you know, I'm learning as I go. I'm, I'm spiritual, right? Well, that doesn't really provide any answers. People say that, and people think that that's somehow or another going to get them out of having to deal with reality. But the reality is you have to decide where I come from, and where you come from is actually going to have a lot to do with where you're going. You have to decide one of those, and you're going to have to decide it based on words. And um, so it's, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting topic. It's, it's almost like nowadays it's kind of like all people, everyone's kind of already settled into their position. It's almost not even a debate anymore. But, but it is very much still uh, a, a, a debate, not so much a debate, but it is still an, a topic that we need to be aware of, and we need to be well-versed in as much as we can. And, and at the end of the day, if, coming at it from the approach of, I'm going to end up believing something. Why would I just choose to believe what Charles Darwin wrote? Right? He came up with a, it was literally called a theory. He even gave allowance for his theory to be wrong. Now here it is, you know, you know, 100 years later, you know, down the road, they're finding all kinds of things. It didn't even take that long, but they're finding things. Oh, that, that kind of blows this theory out of the water. But, but now it's like, no, we've already pushed this to a certain extent. This has given us an excuse to get away from this book and, and the thought of an eternity and judgment and deal, having to deal with a, a God. And so that, that it didn't matter that there were problems with Darwin's theory. Let's just run with this and let's just build it up, Right. And, and, of course, unfortunately, sometimes Christians do the same thing. They, well, I just believe the Bible, and, you know, I don't have any answers for anything. I just believe the Bible. Well, we, we ought to be Bible believers, but we ought to also know why we believe it. We ought to be able to explain it, like he said, a very good point. And, uh, and, if, and if you get, come across something that someone asks you, you can't explain it, just say, well, I, I don't know about that. You know, but what I do know is that Jesus Christ did something for me personally, Right, and I and I know that what he did for me, and and this book is what told me about who Jesus is and what he did, and how it mattered. And so, if I believe that part of the Bible, why wouldn't I believe the whole thing? You know, it's, 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 this stuff is not that complicated. That's what I'm trying to say. But you you are going to have to believe something, and I, I think it's very very. Um, these, these have been really good. I'd like to do another one at some point. Maybe even Evolution Part 2, Old Earth versus Young Earth. That might be interesting. But the, I really like uh, Miles' approach to this. This Let's not get all, you know, and all stirred up. And now we're going to go, and we're going to you know, bite and growl and bite and devour one another, I think it says in the Bible. We're not, we don't have to do that. But at the same time, we don't have to be like, well, I just don't know about anything. I, I don't want to offend you. You know, I just, I just don't know. Well, that might, that's a very interesting point of view. And, you know, there could be some credibility to that. I mean, listen, some, somebody's right and somebody's wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. I happen to think that we're right. <laughs> okay, they think they're right too, but I happen to believe that because of what this book says, because I believe it. And, and they have to land, they have to settle on something along the, the along, same lines too. And what you find out about a lot of the folks on the other side is they actually don't really... They wouldn't, they wouldn't take Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and say, this is my absolute perfect book. They wouldn't say that. They take bits and pieces of whatever it is they want, and they, in their own intellect, become God. That's really the, where, where a lot of, a lot of the, the other side, they become God because they get to be the one that determines what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false, literally based on their own ideas or their interpretation of those ideas. You say, well, aren't you doing the same thing? Kind of, but I'm saying it all comes from this one book, and I, I start off with a very basic premise. This book is perfect. Every word in, in it is, is there for a reason. I do believe that's what Jesus said. Because if you don't take the approach the Bible is perfect, then you've gotta, you're going to you're gonna have to answer Jesus Christ one day who said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every principle, every theory, Every discussion? No, he said, every word of God. That's what, he said, that's what man needs to live, every word of God. So we take the approach, every word in here is perfect. It's perfect, and if it's perfect, then I can believe it. And if I come across something I don't necessarily understand, I can say, I don't understand this, but I do believe it. 
right? And then we can go to God and say, God, give me a revelation on this. Show me something. And then you sit back and wait and don't, you know, beat everybody up that doesn't take that approach or doesn't agree with you. Just say, I don't understand it. And it actually works pretty well. Amen? But uh, this is a blessing. Thank you very much. I really appreciate coming down tonight. Very well done. And I would like to do it again. So it, all, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Yeah, aye. I think it was just Steve. Yeah, well, it was, we, Steve speaks for all of us. <laughs> all right, well, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Thank you, Father, for a chance to come and get together like this again. And thank you for uh, Miles and for just the approach that he has to these topics and these subjects. And we thank you for the wisdom and understanding you've given him in some of these things. I, I know that, uh, Lord, he's humble, and I appreciate that. And I know he's probably learned that um, through some experiences in life that maybe he'll share with us someday, but we do appreciate his humility, but also the intellect and the knowledge you've given him, understanding of these things. And we thank you that he's uh, taken the time to put this together and put it together in a way we can understand and take something away from it. We've got some references, we've got some resources, and hopefully, Lord, uh, got some some ideas of what it is we believe and why and, and what the other side might believe as well. We thank you that you've made these things um, amazingly complex, and that's because that's who you are. But at the same time, it's, it's so simple that we can believe it uh, because the Bible tells us so, like we sing. And so we thank you for these things. We ask you to bless this time we've had together tonight. Use it to equip us in some way we could help point people to you and help us to be the kind of Christians that our lives and our words would, would uh, be in unison together and that we would speak things that are truth and our lives would match that. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's name for his